So it's an entirely different dynamic that's going on. You've got some of the same players, Mel, Burke, some of the guys from before are still around and still wheeling and dealing, but they're wheeling and dealing in a different way. And essentially this time Mel is the kingmaker because he gets an, the right aldermen to agree they haven't got what it takes without having a race riot and therefore they better back Sawyer and then they have trouble propping up Sawyer uh, because he gets cold feet because the black community is yelling at him for doing this um, and splitting the black vote and not carrying forward the Harold Washington legacy. So the dynamics have switched between the daily succession and the Washington succession moving really from ethnic politics to racial politics in a much more clear way. Let's go, let's go ahead to the era of, of uh, the current Mayor Daley, Richard M. Daley. Uh, what, what are the similarities, what are the differences between father and son? Well, I, uh, in what I've done about thinking about that for the Daily to Daily book, I've talked a little about, about how Richard J. Daly grew up in the 1919 race riot and the Bridgeport, the narrow Bridgeport, and the Hamburg Club and the nature of that early formative period. Richard M. Daly, in a sense, grows up in the same neighborhood, but it's not the same generation. Um, like, and we're almost the same age, like me, he um, grows up really becoming of age in the 60s. Now, Richard M. Daly never carried protest signs. He was at the side, father's side at the convention. He becomes later constitutional convention delegate and so forth. But he is of that era. He's of a time when race relations aren't seen the same way. The easiest um, image I have is Richard M. Daly is perfectly comfortable appearing at the Gray Pride Parade in Lakeview whereas his father would have rolled over in his grave over that. I mean, he, he, Richard M. Daly would never have appeared in a gay pride parade unless it was absolutely politically necessary, uh, just like he put Adlai Stevenson on the ticket as uh, U.S. Senator when it became absolutely necessary, even though um, Stevenson had had the temerity to call him a boss a little earlier. That could be forgiven for political expediency. But in general, and he, and he went to the Stevenson picnic that was going to be an anti-boss rally, essentially, by liberal Democrats, not independents, but still. Um, so Richard J. Daley could be expedient, but Richard M. Daley is much more comfortable dealing with the black community, even though it's hard to win over some of that support. He'll work with the black preachers. He'll work with the um, uh, black organizations, community organizations. Um, he's a much more modern man. Um, you know, certainly since he's traveled the world, so he sees the boulevards in Paris and thinks, well, Chicago should have, if not boulevards, at least wrought iron fences and flowers. Um, so it's a different sensibility, and it comes out of um, my generational time growing up. Um, his is a different growing up as part of the boss's family, being part of the Daly family, but he still rubs off on him some. It takes time for it to work itself out and for him to find his own personality, boss, uh, personality and perspective um, different from his father. And he hangs on, of course, to many of the traits. I mean, the most obvious trait he hangs on to is the terrible syntax and inability to speak, but uh, in public, in big settings. Um, so there are many similarities. Um, just like his father recreated the machine, he's recreated the machine. It's now the new daily machine. It has global money, global economy money backing him and he buys a David Axelrod to run his campaigns, just like a presidential campaign with the same techniques. Um, when he had Bill Daley run the campaign in the old days before Bill got experienced, um, it was a disaster and he lost to Harold Washington. So the Daly family learned to move on uh, to the more professional, modernized ways. Uh, so there's a lot of differences between the two. There's a lot of similarities. Um, he doesn't like to be challenged, just like his father didn't. He's been mayor for a long time and he's become, like his father, more autocratic as he's become mayor longer. So you can trace similarities, but the big difference comes out of a different time and a different sensibility. Why don't we circle back? Uh, 
remind us uh, where you were born, your education, and then how you first came to Chicago. I was born in Houston, Texas. Um, grew up with a pretty traditional um, upbringing in, a, you know, in Texas at the time. My father was in the oil business. Um, we were sort of middle class family, uh, slowly worked into maybe upper middle class, but we were middle class most of, the, of all of my childhood. Um, the, um, I was a Boy Scout. Uh, one of the things, um, I sort of believed all of the um, American myths, the Abraham Lincolns, the Western code of ethics, um, uh, the cowboy mentality, the uh, independence. Um, so I grew up on American myths, but unlike a number of people who don't take them very seriously at the time, I probably believed them all. Um, I did have some different experiences. Um, I was a caddy at the golf course for my father and his friends at the country club, but that meant I was like all the black caddies at the, col at the golf course. Uh, I was a Boy Scout leader, so that meant I was a camp counselor, but I was a camp counselor when it was all black Boy Scouts, not just when the whites showed up. Um, uh, I went to a military academy, Texas A&M, and it wasn't a very good fit. I've never been so great about handling authority figures when they're wrong. Uh, and it was like a bad fraternity and a bad military, both run amok. Uh, I had a rebellion there when uh, classmates, um, who I didn't know, but lived upstairs in the dorm, um, he decided to quit the Corps of Cadets, and uh, they were afraid he would squeal. He would tell that um, he had, um, that the upperclassmen had hazed, contrary to the rules. And so um, they uh, got the freshmen in his company to throw out all of his gear, his clothes, his papers, and everything from the fourth story window. For some strange reason, they very carefully carried down his records and set them out on the lawn rather than throwing them out, which I found a little peculiar. Anyway, I wrote an op-ed or an editorial in the Wesley Foundation newspaper against him, and that caused the Corps of Cadets to ostracize me. They were afraid this would become public knowledge and that this whole incident would besmirch the grand image of Texas A&M. I stayed the rest of my period there uh, as a freshman and then moved to the University of Texas. At the same time, I was part of the YMCA, YWCA, which was integrated, and I went to integrated conferences with blacks and whites. And one of my uh, sort of mentors was the chaplain at uh, Prairie View A&M. Texas A&M was white, Prairie View A&M was black. And I, on some weekends, would drive down and spend time with the black minister who was the chaplain at Prairie View A&M and also the student body president and folks down there. Um, so when I moved to the University of Texas, it was not a very big leap for me to become part of the civil rights movement. Um, we mentioned I became a minister later. When I went to the University of Texas, I was part of the Christian faith and life community, which had the heretical notion that lay people ought to have a role in church. Um, um, that they could read uh, not only the gospel, but theology and could apply it, and uh, that the church ought to be run by the lay people, uh, not just the minister. Mm -hmm. And so that was a reform movement of the church, and they were training. Um, I was a sophomore at the time and, and a junior. Um, they were training us to read uh, Paul Tillich and Bonhoeffer and philosophers and the rest and debate them. and to write our own church services and things like that. And we were living in a former motel with separate rooms and ate meals together. And it was a community, and it was very easy then to move that community into the civil rights movement when it happened at the University of Texas. I went on to school. I then became interested, because I'm now involved in civil rights and things, I've become interested in Africa. Some of my friends are interested in Africa. Africa's just beginning to get its independence as nations. And so I uh, go to Indiana University to study African politics because there are only four or five places in the country that teach African politics. I uh, finished my PhD, finished my, my uh, coursework, go to Sierra Leone uh, to do my field work for a year, 
write my dissertation, come back. And while I'm in Africa, uh, the cities are going up in flames. This is 1966. And um, Newark and places like that are burning. And I'm in Africa, you, you didn't have the kind of communications we have today. I get all my news through Time Magazine and Newsweek once I, when I see them and every few weeks or so. Um, um, and so my view of America is from Time and Newsweek, often delayed weeks. Um, and so I get this and I write back to my advisor at Indiana University and I say, here's a list of cities, get me a job in one of them, maybe I can be of some use. One of the cities on the list is Chicago. Bloomington, Indiana is not far from Chicago, so we visited some friends up here once or twice. I knew very little about the city. Um, I, uh, it turned out the University of Illinois at Chicago was looking for someone who could teach African politics. I came up and did a job interview and took the job. Um, could just have easily have ended up in Washington, D.C. or New York City or some other place on the list of 10. In those days, you didn't worry about getting a job. You had a degree, you got a job. Um, you know, the, it's entirely different from the job market today in academia and everywhere else. So it wasn't an issue of was I going to have a job, it was where did I, wh what did I want? And so I sent my wish list and I got it. Um, happened, Chicago made the first bid and I knew enough about, you know, I'd been to Old Town once and uh, we had a couple of friends who had now lived in Chicago that I'd known from the YMCA. Um, and so by chance I ended up in Chicago. And then uh, you, you, you worked for the McCarthy campaign in 1968. Started in 67. Um, the first day we came to Chicago, in fact, it's interesting, I just uh, saw today the obituary of uh, Marvin Jones who headed the poverty program in Bloomington, Indiana. My wife had worked for him in uh, running the tutoring program. Anyway, Marvin, um, came with us to move stuff up to Chicago. We heard about this alternative um, party convention that was have third party convention essentially that was happening in Chicago. The day we moved in, we go down to that. Um, they try and draft. L literally the day you moved in? Yeah, or the day after. One, right, the day right, right. We, we've just arrived in Chicago. Um, we go to this national alternative convention and they're drafting McCarthy as a candidate or trying to, and he gives a talk, but it's not very, you know, it's not firm yet what's gonna happen. This is still a long time before the start of the primaries. Mm -hmm. This is August, and the real election process is gonna start in a couple of months. So um, sometime, I start teaching school in September, right after Labor Day, um, my first job uh, here. And uh, by about November, there is a McCarthy for President campaign effort in Chicago. Somehow I hear about it. I live in the 9th Congressional District on the north side of Chicago. Lived in Lincoln Park at the time. Um, and I go to one of the gatherings or meetings and it seems to me they're doing it all wrong. So I say, you guys are doing it all wrong. you know. And so they make me um, 9th Congressional District campaign coordinator. Uh, since I seem to think there's another way we could do this. Um, and so I serve as 9th Congressional District Campaign Coordinator on through until the March primary.